And now for a East Asia region summary of all the stuff that we've been now talking about. And just like the lecture series itself, it is going to be pretty China-centered. And that's because China is back, right? China is a major world power. It is a big country like the United States, about the same size as the United States. It is a big economy, about the same size as the United States. It's got a big military, nowhere near the size of the United States, but they're working on that. <laughs> We've discussed this. So what we're looking at is a century in which China and the United States are the major world power players, and they're going to be for perhaps centuries to come. Let's round out some pluses about China and the region in general and then maybe talk about that this region has some problems, as do other major power players like the United States. Namely, kind of the big pluses, a summary of the big pluses of China. Big place, big economy, big military. Got that. Check. Uh, reassuming its place on the world stage. Check. Uh, increasingly becoming an option for other states to do business with or to outright ally with. China is becoming not the anti-America, but the other America. Remember, the Europeans for a couple hundred years, and then the Americans for the last 50 or 60, really dominated world affairs, dominated the banking and financial institutions, dominated militarily, and have set the stage for, hey, everybody should kind of do what we want. And what we want is, say, a focus on human rights and liberal democracy and all this other stuff. China is now an equivalent power, and it says, Hey, we're here on the world stage too, and we would like you guys to ally with us or work with us or partner with us, and we don't have the same kind of design and mission that Team West does. We're the option. You can do business with us. You can work with us, and of course, that is increasingly happening. Also, keep in mind that uh, China is a permanent veto welding, uh, a Security Council member at the United Nations, uh, is a member of the WTO now is not a member of ASEAN, but is an associate member, is a member of APEC, of BRICS, uh, and increasingly all of those other financial, economic, uh, multi-state -reg multi regional organizations that I've been talking about throughout this entire lecture. China is becoming an increasingly important player in all of these things, especially all the Asian groupings. Not just ASEAN, but the Silk Road stuff we've talked about and probably a half dozen or dozen other initiatives that China is pushing to build regional unity, Eurasian unity, if you like, with China at the center. And it's been working, and largely because China uh, is, is seeing the fruits of their labor of the last couple decades of a pretty savvy, suave foreign policy. Uh, done with an eye for resource acquisitions, done for an eye with increasing trade, done with an eye for becoming a, the option to the United States and Team West. Meaning China hasn't really gotten involved in any foreign wars. I can't think of any. Uh, really doesn't intervene in other countries' affairs. Remember, China's the number one fan of sovereignty, for better or for worse. Uh, so it doesn't have the cultural baggage that Team West has been carrying around and building upon for a couple of centuries. So on top of that, we've already talked about the economy ad nauseum, but of course their economy is still doing quite well. It's in a bit of a recession here, say in 2016, but a huge domestic demand, pent up materialistic demand from a billion and a half Chinese people, which ensures that their economy will still keep going strong of people just in China buying Chinese goods, much less China continuing to be a manufacturing and perhaps even now service sector uh, giant on planet Earth, providing stuff and services for the rest of the world. And this has resulted in a growing middle class, an increasingly growing middle class, an increasingly growing millionaire and billionaire class in China that shows no signs of slowing any time soon. Now to back it up for the region, also do consider that even though I personally consider Japan as a separate, its own region, not part of the East Asian region, it may be someday, but do consider that you know China is the number one or number two economy already on planet Earth. Uh, Japan is number three, okay, either way. Often overlooked, South Korea is either 10, 11, or 12, depending on what list you look at. And so what you're looking at for the region as a whole is, uh, uh, within the next decade, easy, three of the world's top 10 biggest economies will all be next door neighbors. That's a huge big deal, really big deal. 
South Korea's economy is vibrant and awesome and fully developed, and they're rich, and people forget about them, quite frankly, because they're between two giant economies. But South Korea ain't nothing to scoff at. So three top ten world economies, all within a stone's throw of each other, as long as they keep getting along. But that brings us to the big minuses. With big pluses in a big country with a big economy and lots of big things going on and all this nationalistic pride swelling and everybody thinks China's great, hang on. They got issues and problems just like any other country, especially a big, powerful country of their size. And that is, with power comes responsibility. I know I'm harking back to Peter Parker's uncle, that's Spider-Man, for those of you who don't know. Yes, now that China's a big boy and is playing the big boy role on planet Earth and is saying we are a world power and we're an option and other people can ally with us, you, you have to start picking up some certain responsibilities. You, you're not going to be able to keep supporting dictatorships or turn a blind eye to genocides or do other things that China of the 10 or 20 or 30 years ago could pull off. Because at that point they'd say, well, it's not got nothing to do with us. We're just buying oil from Sudan. Well, you're a major power now, and you're going to have to pony up the responsibility, and you're going to have to pony up and send more funds to the United Nations, and you're going to have to pony up and send more troops uh, into uh, the field for the UN. So China is going to have to start not just taking the benefits of being a world power, but paying the price of being a world power, and it inevitably will be dragged in to a conflict somewhere. It's just the way these things work. Uh, now, we have talked about China getting super, super rich, and it has been, uh, gotten super, super rich, but that also means that wealth disparity is increasing. Yes, they've pulled hundreds of millions of people above the poverty line, and that's awesome. But there are still, I don't know, hundreds of millions of people below the poverty line. And as that millionaire billionaire class has risen and the lowest class has gone nowhere, you have increasing wealth disparity. This is a problem that the United States of America knows all too well right now in the 21st century. You can't let those things keep festering. So they have some work to do with uh, the folks getting left behind. There, are, of course, also is this massive rural to urban shift in China where the countryside has emptied out as they have pretty much given up on being an agricultural-based society, which they were way back in 1950. I know, it seems like forever ago. It's not that long ago. So China's still adjusting to this situation that millions and millions of people are still wanting to come to the big cities everywhere in order to get jobs and, you know... As the economy starts to slow down and settle down, because it's not going to go double-digit growth forever, as things slow down, job creation slows down, everything slows down, and you still have millions of people showing up to get jobs, that becomes a major issue for China to deal with. On top of the environmental destruction which has been wrought in their drive to become a full-fledged, rich, developed country in the last five decades. And that is not to be overestimated. Go check out the small levels in Beijing to see what I'm talking about. Much less go Google for environmental disasters in China. There is so much garbage and waste and uh, mines are a disaster. Uh, it has the highest mining death rate on planet Earth, usually with coal mines. So, I, and of course, if people are dying in them, then you know that there's no great environmental laws protecting uh, the cleanup around these issues. So... Just like the Soviet Union, there was a really big push to become rich. And it has worked, and it's done wonders for millions of Chinese people, but they kind of just sideline the whole environmental issue. And now everybody in Beijing can be super rich, and that's great. But if you can't send your kids to school because they can't breathe the air in Beijing, then what the hell good does all your money do? And more and more Chinese people are waking up to this fact of, well, wait a minute. We like being rich, but we would also like clean air, clean water, health regulations, laws against environmental dumping. So you're starting to see just the beginnings of, I think, an environmental movement starting in China that's perhaps overdue, but certainly is going to be demanded by the people. So the Chinese government's going to have to deal with that, too. And by the way, I'm not just a tree hugger saying everything should be happy and green and pleasant, which I do think that. But you have to keep in mind that when you clean up your country and when you make environmental laws tougher and make it harder on businesses to pollute and dump and do all sorts of nasty-ass things, 
what happens? Some businesses leave. Uh, the cost of labor goes up. The cost of everything goes up, and that means there's not going to be as many jobs, and some businesses are going to go to Southeast Asia or someplace else where they can pollute and do whatever they want. So this is a delicate balancing act for the Chinese government of like, yes, we have to provide the stuff our people want, but we know it's also going to affect the bottom line on the economy. So things aren't as simple as just, oh, well, let's just make everything clean. Yeah, yeah, easier said than done. You also have uh, um, population issues, health issues related to some of the environmental uh, uh, stuff that I've just talked about, but you have an increasingly aging population in China and increasingly obese population in China. One of the other <laughs> unmentioned benefits of a society getting richer, unmentioned benefit of a society getting richer is that people eat more food and they typically adopt a Western diet and start eating more KFC and McDonald's and processed food, and so people are getting bigger. Heart disease is increasing in China, obesity is increasing, diabetes is increasing. Uh, and we already talked about the environmental issues, so their health, uh, our, our breathing issues are increasing. China's gonna have to deal with all this, and on top of it, the population is aging, meaning there are more and more old people who are retiring and less and less young people going into the workforce. Just look at this projected thing I found somewhere online of China's 60 plus population. In 2010, it was estimated that 167 million people were above the age of 60. By 2020, that may be 248 million. By 2050, it may be 437 million people above the age of 60. These are people who ain't working, uh, who are geriatric, who need more health care, who need care, period. I'm cup I put that on top of any sort of regular uh, issues that we've been talking about with health and obesity and, and air quality and water quality. When people get old, they become more of a drain on society. And China's people have been only having one to two kids on average. That's just barely replacement level. Who's going to pay the taxes on all that stuff? Who's going to take care of all these folks? The, co the country's seen their family size shrink since 1950, and now it's becoming a detriment of crap. We don't have as much people, not as much people to pay taxes, not as much people to have cheaper labor, not as much people to take care of all the old people. See how this is starting to become a really, really big deal. Uh, on top of that, when people get richer, they usually start demanding more better quality life, but perhaps even more rights and maybe more voice in their country. Maybe the next time that there's a big scandal and there's some tainted baby formula that kills 100 kids, which has happened, uh, people get enraged and say, the government better step up and we need tougher laws and we're demanding our government to do something. And the next time that there's a, uh, a, a bird flu uh, epidemic that breaks out and the government covers it up, which has happened, the Chinese people get angry and say, we want more clarity in our government. We want the government to be more accountable. Hey man, that's how political revolutions start. So as people get richer and more educated and more wiser about what's going on around them, they usually start demanding more and that's where the Chinese government could see problems in the future of, oh, <laughs> it's again, it's a delicate balancing act, giving people what they want without giving them the whole farm and letting them have a democracy, for goodness sakes. My gosh, who might want that? Anyway, let me step it back and not focus just so much on China for a couple of negative points about the broader East Asian region. Namely, I said that, you know, China's got a really big military. They do. They have the largest standing army on planet Earth, right? North Korea has the fourth largest military on planet Earth. Japan doesn't have a military at all, right? They have a self-defense force. Uh-huh, sure they do. Watch for that self-defense force to become a military very soon, and it will probably be a top 10 or top 20 world military. Okay, why am I pointing all this stuff out? Well, because you have frictions within this East Asian region, and big militaries could make for very big problems in the coming century. Namely, Korea continues to be a gigantic powder keg with the fuse sticking out and people holding matches all around it. Crazy, whack crazy Kim Jong-un, uh, the goofball with the bad haircut in charge of uh, a completely insane hermit kingdom in North Korea could at any time flip out, shoot a rocket at Japan, shoot a rocket across the border to South Korea, and initiate a new phase of the Korean War, which would be potentially catastrophic, catastrophic in loss of life and limb and property damage. It's almost too scary to even think about, 
Remember, Korea is not a really big place. North and South Korea are next door neighbors, and there are tens and tens or twenties or thirties of millions of folks within a very short rocket flight of each other. When this goes bad, this will go really, really, really bad. There is no winner in a North Korean meltdown of any kind. None. Not South Korea, not North Korea, not Japan, and not even China. And it's really up to China to probably reel in North Korea before it gets to that crisis point since they're the only ones who really can. Get to work on that, China. Other things of note for the region as a whole, the historic China-Japan uh, animosity and the historic Korean-Japan animosity and frictions will continue to stymie the full potential of this Asian region. Meaning, they still have not gotten over World War II. Any of them. Any of them. And you can back it up all the way to the uh, Japanese invasion of the Korean Peninsula back in 1895. These historic underpinnings are still sensitive to Asian societies. And even though none of us were born when these things happened, institutional memory is still there. And there's still a lot of almost outright hatred between some Chinese and Japanese people and some Korean and Japanese people. And until these three countries can get over that, and, you know, I'm not suggesting they forget it, but get over it enough to actually become something more akin to allies, friends, and full-fledged partners in Asian endeavors, they will never achieve their full potential. Okay? And it's not going to be easy for that to happen either, either given that Japan is good friends with the United States, South Korea is kind of good friends with the United States, and that also bothers China. So there's another layer of animosity between these teams. And that brings me to the last. That is that the China Team West competition in the Pacific and across greater Eurasia uh, will continue to be complicated for the rest of our lives as the region is kind of split between those states that fully back China as the new kid on the block in the world superpower du jour, or who want to kind of stick with the United States and Team West to help counter China and its dominant, perhaps dominance of the Eurasian continent. Will an Asian axis of democracy end up encircling China? Uh, will that be an effective counter to China's growth? Or will China's economic and military might make such a axis of democracy surrounding them pretty much useless anyway? Or will it exacerbate existing frictions and cause an all-out war between some of these entities? I don't know. This is all speculative. These are some of the major things to think about when you're thinking about the East Asian region. Regardless of the potential uh, and or predicted futures uh, we're chatting about about China and the East Asian region, let me kind of end with the Chinese dream uh, is well underway. And that is a phrase you should probably jot down, the Chinese dream, Chinese dream. This is actually a phrase that's been coined like the American dream. Ah, ah, see, you've heard of that. The Chinese dream sounds weird to you, or China dream. Uh, the China dream is a term that's been popularized since about 2013. Hmm, when Xi Jinping took over the country. Uh, and it's uh, uh, popularized within the Chinese socialist thought process and the Communist Party itself. And it kind of describes a set of personal and national ideas and the People's Republic of China and again, specifically, the Communist Party of China. It's been used by journalists, government officials, and activists to describe, I don't know how to put this, describe the role of the individual in Chinese society, as well as the goals of the Chinese nation as a whole. Uh, again, Xi Jinping, President Xi Jinping, drops this bomb, the Chinese dream, all the time. It was, again, originally interpreted as an extension of, say, the American dream, which emphasizes individuality, self-improvement and opportunity, the American dream. You know what that means to you? It means you can do anything. The Chinese dream isn't that just in China. It's that, but more, there's a nationalistic component of this. Um, it's often linked with the dream, the China dream, being consistently linked with the phrase, the great revival of the Chinese nation. So the United States, America never had a revival as it were. They've always just kind of grown, grown, grown in power and been really awesome. So the American dream is you can do anything. The Chinese dream is we 
can do anything. We as individuals can do a lot, but we are reviving our great state again. Yeah! That makes sense? The China dream. Uh, economically, of course, they've already revived the China dream, and now they're getting on to the rest of the business that I talked about in the last couple of lectures of really expressing themselves as a world power. And the greater region as a whole is fast becoming what I call the... The, the center of the universe, the center of the world, if you like it, the economic center, the financial center, the political centering of the world. To summarize, for the region, they're going to have three of the top ten world economies next door neighbors. If not already, then Korea will, South Korea will join the top ten here soon. So that's a lot of economic clout going on just with countries right here all together. So what I mean by becoming the center of the world is that Europe was the economic center of the world for several hundred years. And then America kind of took over from them. And this kind of center, this focus, you know, there's economic energy all over the planet, but the center of it is the, kind of the hub, is the middle, is the real energy. And it went from Europe to America, and now, so it crossed the Atlantic, and now it's slowly crossing the Pacific to be centered up here in the East Asian region. That's not to say that the United States is still not going to be powerful and rich. We are! But the center, the economic gravitational forces are pulling uh, to East Asia. Really, I think they already are kind of the economic center of the world. But don't overlook uh, that the East Asian region, China uh, particularly, but also South Korea, and, and let's include Japan for fun, is also becoming the technological and innovative center of planet Earth as well. Okay? They're doing, these three states are doing everything that rich Western countries do, and in fact, they're doing more of it. When you just start thinking about research in genetics or space programs or putting people on the moon or on Mars, the upper levels of research and development, the, those East Asian states are on the spot. Johnny, on the spot. South Korea had at one point promised to have a robot in every household by 2020. I don't know if they're going to make that goal, but when it comes to genetics, robotics, science, space, all of these things, these countries have an energy to push forward, much the way that the United States and the Soviet Union were locked in races of technology back during the Cold War. Now it's between East Asian states. So, economically, technologically, innovation speaking, but also don't overlook the simpler things in life, or I should say the more tangible things in life. East Asia, I believe, has already become kind of a center for culture for fashion, for art, design, architecture, film. There's so much great cinemas coming out of all three of these states. It's just fantastic, fantastic film. And I don't even know that much about fashion, but we have classically thought of, oh, well, the fashion capital of the world is Paris on the catwalk, or Milan, where they have these fancy fashion shows once a year, or even maybe in New York. I hate to tell you this, folks, but a lot of things, even in fashion, gets developed in South Korea or China, and then later, within six months or a year, is showing up uh, on the catwalks over in Europe or America. So when you start to look around, you're starting to see this energy, this creative energy on multiple fronts that's happening in East Asia, and that's a perfect place to end with <laughs> on the catwalks of Beijing. By saying, in summary of the summary, there is a epic Asian epicenter shift underway. Again, for 500 years, it was the Europeans. Then it migrated across the Atlantic to the United States. Now it's migrating across the Pacific to East Asia, China focused in particular. But don't be scared. Just roll with it. Things change. That's the one thing you can always count on in uh, human endeavors and history is that nothing is stagnant for very long. So the United States may not be the biggest economy on planet Earth. The Europeans are slowly becoming not that important economically or culturally. But they had their heyday and things, what comes around goes around. And it's back to being an Asian-focused world again Final thought, the way that it had been for a lot of history, for the last couple thousand years of history, is returning back now in the 21st century. Cool? Did you learn anything? Do you have a greater respect for China and the East Asian region in general? 
Hope so. If you have any questions, of course, hit me up anytime, and I can always make another little podcast and insert it into the lecture series. Party on, Asian style.